We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question is, what games did you grow up playing that you still enjoy and play today? So this is a question that gets asked now and then, mainly on social media, enough times that I can't pin it down to one particular person asking. We basically had three questions in our question list that were all asking the same kind of thing. And it comes up a lot when we'll post nostalgia. I find when I share my memories, say on Facebook, of an old game and people are like, oh, but do you still play it, right? And then usually it'll be, do you still play it? And then someone's, what other games from your childhood do you still enjoy playing? And so on. So it's kind of an organic question that we've been asked a number of times that I thought would be a fun topic that also ties in well with tonight's review. So I kind of thought we'd wrap everything together here to kind of make a theme for the entire episode. You know, sometimes these questions are about older games that still get played. People are looking for hobby board games that are, you know, five or ten or more years old. But in this case, we want to highlight even older games, mm -hmm. games we played when we were kids. I'm thinking young kids to early teens. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Like, I can think of plenty of great games that I loved back then that I would still be perfectly happy to play today. Absolutely. Thankfully, my parents didn't really buy kids games mm. and just played their games with us that are now in my collection nice i wish i could have got my dad's collection off him but unfortunately he sold it well not unfortunately for the guy but he sold it to someone he played games with all the time which makes sense i wish i had gotten some of those games though for me growing up it was a mix but i'll admit most of the the real kids games except for a few didn't make the list tonight because most older kids games just weren't that great now, as usual, this list is in no particular order and is in no way inclusive. These mm -hmm. are the games that we used to love, that we will enjoy, not a list of all the great games that were out when we were kids that are still fun. I have to throw that caveat on there just to, to kind of curb back some of the comments we get, no matter what we make a list about. Heck, some of the games, honestly, on this list may not be great games, uh, but our existing joy in still playing them probably comes from a bit of a place of nostalgia and rather than mechanics that actually happen to stand the test of time. Sometimes it's just a hit of feelings you need more than an objectively great game. Heck, there's one of them that's on my list that, that I, I would almost say is a bad game now and day that's been improved, but it's going to make the list tonight. All right, I am going to start off with the only standard board game box style game that looks like a kid's game that you picked up at the, the local department store and the only real kid's game on my list, and that is Cats from Chieftain Games, uh, which I later learned was called Cats Mansion in the U.S. when I think it was published by Parker Brothers, but I'm, I couldn't, don't, don't, don't quote me on that one. So Cats is a hidden role game where you have five cats on the board and the board kind of looks like clue and there's four presents on the board. Well, you play four players and you randomly are assigned a cat. You don't tell anyone which cat you are. And then you're really randomly assigned a present you're trying to get to. Then on your turn, you get so many movement points and you can move cats or presents. And the whole goal is to get your cat to match up with your present. And if you do that, you win. Now, the whole thing is, if you start rushing towards that mouse with the gray cat, everyone else is going to figure out, well, you're obviously the gray cat trying to get the mouse and mess with you and do everything impossible to try to get you to not get it. Now, along with this, there's different rooms and there's these meow cards that cause the cats to run all over the house. And then there's purr cards to say, no, my cat doesn't move. And there's a whole bunch of take that. But it's a brilliant game with that whole, you don't know who's playing what. And like, there's modern games like um, Quicksand that kind of use the same mechanic, but I just love cats probably because I grew up with it. Plus, it still has the best player pawns I've ever seen in a game ever. Yeah, no, there are some, we had some fantastic times playing this, both rules as written and maybe a little less so. <laughs> yes. But that was Cats or Cats Mansion in the US. Now, my first game is actually International Movie Maker, which is this one right up here. Uh, a roll and move much like Monopoly, but without the same level of evolving board ownership that makes it honestly much more fun as the game goes on than Monopoly. You're trying to make movies by collecting a story, a director, male and female stars, and a number of locations, depending on the type of story, and make a movie before trying to profit off that movie or often watch it flop and <laughs> lose all your money. Now, while it is highly random and it's very much a roll and move, 
it hits a spot that Monopoly never could for me. It almost seems like it's got aspects of Game of Life with all the stuff you're collecting along the way. A little bit, but it is just the you know around the edge of the board. Yeah. There's no there's no paths or anything like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll admit, despite knowing Sean for years, I don't think I ever played this one with you. No, no, this was a family. This was a, like a, yeah. only a family game sort of thing. Yeah, I never reason. I never played this one growing up. And that was International Movie Maker. Next, I've got Clue, the classic Hasbro deduction game. While I don't love it. Deanna got me to try this game as an adult. Like I didn't grow up playing a ton of clue. Like I played it a couple times, but she made me try it with her copy. And I was like, why are we keeping that? Why do we have clues? She's like the clues actually good. So we sat down and we played it and I got to say for an older roll and move game, I found a lot to like. Now I'm not rushing out to buy any new edition or making sure we need a deluxe copy, but, or even honestly playing this multiple times a year. But if I sat down with a group and they're like, Hey, tonight we're playing clue. I'm not going to say no. I also grew up playing Clue, and while some modern versions, like the Harry Potter one my family got, and we've talked about previously, can ruin the game, yes. uh, others, especially more classic versions, can continue to make this an enjoyable family game for all problem solvers. And that was Clue. And now my next game is Spellmaker. That's this one right up here. Uh, this is a quirky 1970s Rescue the Princess game. You're playing a wizard in his tower, trying to guide a princess back to your domain and throwing around a simple selection of smell spells, making use of knights, frogs, toadstools, trolls, and more. <laughs> now, in its rules as written form, the game is not without its issues, though it's clearly got a game there. And experimentation with house rules often came up with some wildly fun games. <laughs> now, interestingly, I learned today that the game as sold and the game as designed actually differ. Interesting. And the designer did an interview in uh, White Dwarf magazine that said, if you do this to the deck of cards, it speeds up and improves the game back to what we had designed. Huh. Uh, interestingly, my sister actually requested that we play that this that game this Christmas. Oh, and so nice. I plan on introducing the designer's original changes into the game for that. I look forward to hearing that in a future Bellhops tabletop to know if it can be improved. This is another one I'd never even heard of. You that and I was, actually had played, I think, we had? once or twice, but it okay. was not rules as written. It was, let's see what we yeah, do Let's goof around with the game. Okay, maybe that's possible. I don't remember this one, we'll say. <laughs> that was Spell Maker. Uh, next up, I have Waterworks. This is a card-based pipe-laying card game that actually reminds me of some modern tile laying games like i get a kind of carcass own vibe from this you play pipes trying to make a full I don't know, circuit like a completed pipe works i don't know how i don't know how to word that but you're trying to basically get the the, the faucet to come out the other end um while also playing broken pipes on your opponents and things like that one of the highlights of this game were these little metal wrenches that were on there that you played on your pipes to repair them and honestly, this is one we found while clearing out my parents' house to sell it. I found my dad's old copy. And Deanna was like, well, we got to play it. So we actually sat down and played it. And I'm like, wow, that's that's like not bad. Like, I remember liking it as a kid, but it, I remember more just building giant pipework things than actually trying to play the game. I also, there's actually a modern version of this um, published by Jamie Chambers, uh, who I knew on G+, called Building an Elder God, which is Cthulhu meets Waterworks. All right. Uh, and it's amusing that you refound this through your dad's copy because it was actually my copies. My family actually had two copies. So we had the okay. double size with all the extra wrenches and you could play more players. Uh, and we used to play that in the basement uh, going all the way back to mm -hmm. Rankin, the original house. Yeah. Uh, I'm not actually sure where my copy right, uh, is right now, but I would absolutely play that again. And that is Waterworks. Now, next up, my game is the classic uno now we and probably most people played the uh this extreme with stacked <laughs> pickup cards it was still yep. a fun game and one that i introduced to my kids and still play with them to this day yeah uno is a game i did play with the kids i have we have a copy in the minivan that we're like when we're on road trips or whatever they, they brought a copy when they went up to algonquin park that was one of the games we played i'm not a huge fan if anyone recommends I play Uno, I'll probably do it, but I might recommend something else. 
That was Uno. Speaking of classic card games, the next one I have is Racco. Uh, Deanna and I recently rediscovered this one due to them having a copy at the Bandit Bruce Banded Goose Brewery in Kingsville. Uh, tune into our review segment, which follows this one, to learn more about Racco. And that was Racco. Now, my next one isn't a specific game, but rather a group of games. Those being traditional card games, because I, if I just did this list, I almost could just go <laughs> traditional card games I still play, and it would be an extensive list. It's games you use a standard deck of cards. My parents were huge card game players. Uh, my mom still today, right now, while we are recording, my mom is at the Moose Lodge playing cribbage. So that is something they, they, that my mom still does. Uh, always. My parents always had a deck of cards. Anytime we were going to be somewhere for an hour or more and there was a table involved, cards got played. Uh, as well, I got taught multiple different solitaire versions. Like I like traditional solitaire, like, but there's one called Clock I love. Another one called King's Corner that I will happily play to kill time. But more importantly, it was the group games, Spades, Hearts, and Euchre being the big three, my favorites, as well as big group games like Past the Ace and 31, which were usually the big parties with the ball teams and, and or even my own birthday parties at the Knights of Columbus, we played these games. And to this day, if someone invites me to play a game of cards, I'll play a game of cards with them. Now, I'd probably rather play like Macaron as a trick-taking game, but these are the games that everyone knows, right? Like you can sit down... Most people already know how to play the basics, even Crazy 8s, right? Instead of Uno, I'd rather play Crazy 8s than Uno in most cases. I just, standard card games, like, I haven't gotten sick of them, and I don't think I will, and I just, I don't think people do get sick of them. And it's, there does set, definitely seem to be some sort of a French-Canadian influence, because yeah. I know it, it seems to be that side of my family and that side of my wife's family who always were the card players, so... That was traditional card games. Now, my next game is the game of life, but not the new one. Now, <laughs> yes, I'm aware the old one has got some problematic content in it. But when they changed those parts, they changed the gameplay as well. And that's what I miss, as well as the fantastic components mm -hmm. that have also been eliminated from most, if not all, modern versions of the game like you used to get glass bottles for your your pegs that were your people that were actually pegs and like the nice molded cars and you know real physical components and you know you could flip open the uh the box that held all the cash and it turned into a, a way of stacking out your mm -hmm. cash all the little touches like that have just kind of gone by the wayside to uh, help you know keep the price down i guess I got to say, for a roll and move game, I liked this one because there were decision points. That was the big thing. I'm like, to me, that made that game. The fact I got to choose, do you go to college or not, I think was the first decision you made in that game. And, and there were reasons to go both ways. And do you want to rush to the end or do you want to take your time and possibly buy the big house? I, I really enjoyed life. I don't know if I'd enjoy it now. Like, I couldn't put this on the list because I haven't replayed the game of life in years. I think we played it with Sean Skolak on the PlayStation. I had some version of the game of life and that was fun, but there was all these like weird spinners and randomizers, which was stuff you can only do on a PlayStation. So I don't even think that counts. Yeah. I had played the new, the new version and was disappointed by it because yeah. of, of those reasons. But uh, yeah, I still, uh, still have a love for it. Just a, a side note. I had that problem with operation. I used to like operation and the new version removed the cards. It was just, a pure dex to take a turn, try to get something out. If you buzz, you miss the rest of your turn. Oh, they took out like the game of it. How weird. Yeah, I thought it was really strange. Cat and Tori won a copy of it in extra life auction because they had heard about it, uh, which was pretty funny. Well, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's a side note. We were actually talking about the game of life, which is on this list. Next, of all games I have Connect for. Yes, it's super simple. Yes, when both players are experienced and both paying attention, which is important, you often end up with a tie game. But there's something about Connect Four that's still fun after all these years. Nowadays, when I play Connect Four is when we stumble upon it. We, we check out Cafe March 21 downtown Windsor that we're told has good ramen. We're sitting waiting for our ramen and there's a copy of Connect Four on a shelf over there you can grab. And sure enough, we grab it and we're like, you know, this is actually quite fun. Or we're at a pub having a few pints and there's a copy of Connect Four. And that's where it actually gets challenging because you lose that focus and make stupid mistakes. Uh, another thing I dig, though, that I didn't even know about until discovering at a cafe March 21 and doing Googling is there are a number of house rules that to me make it a game. 
with my favorite being what they call blind connect four, where you can't see the board. And what you have to do is go, I have connect four, and then you reveal it and see if you have it. If you have connect four, you win. If you don't, the opponent loses. And I love that version of the game where there's a memory element there. And I think there's even some, there's some social stuff there. Like you're going to be bluffing like, no, no, you don't have over there. I remember I put this here and then you put this and I don't know. I connect four is probably like the, the, the silliest kids game on my list, but still I enjoy playing it in the right atmosphere. You know, it was funny you brought that up because uh, when we were at our company dinner at the big, at the company conference uh, a month or so ago, uh, or I guess a couple, yeah, back in September, um, yeah. <laughs> when we were, they, we, it was, a, they went to a, a billiard hall, but one yep. of the things they had was a giant mm -hmm. Connect Four board, like probably two and a half, three feet tall by three feet wide Connect Four board with big honking wooden, yep. uh, wooden pieces. So yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. And that was Connect Four. Talking about giant Connect Four, if you ever go to any of the events in Kingsville, Ontario, Kingsville, Ontario has a very beautiful downtown that they do, they close off the streets so people can walk and they do pedestrian. They have a giant Connect Four at that. And my kids, every time they go, insist they have to stop and play a game of giant Connect Four. Cool. So uh, my next game is upwards the scrabble knockoff according to some <laughs> but personally i have always found the flexibility you get in upwards refreshing while scrabble tends to reward learning obscure words that basically only exist for use in scrabble yeah. upwards you can actually use real words and, and make them count yeah, Scrabble people could, have been trying to convince me that it's a hobby gamer game and that it's actually an area majority game or area control game where the words don't matter. It's what spaces you're taking up. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I am not a Scrabble fan. I read a lot of books, but Sean and Deanna that do my editing know how bad my, uh, my spelling and my dyslexia can be. So just not a game for me. Whereas I do prefer Upwards, though I will admit Deanna loves Upwards. We still have her copy um she loved it growing up and still enjoyed it but she took it out and like taught me to play it and i just i didn't love it like it it, it was okay but like i would rather play it. like for word games i like boggle the boggle i possibly could have put on this list but again i don't really like word games <laughs> like i like playing boggle with someone that's on the same level as me but like i play boggle against deanna and i just feel like it's a it's futile i'm like i found 20 words she's like i found 172 and 20 of them are yours you get no points yeah, well, and, that, and that's one of the things the chat room actually brought up earlier on about when talking about upwards is it really does matter who you're playing it with. Yeah. And that goes for all the word games, really. Like, I mean, and the same with math games, right? You don't want to play math games with uh, Albert Einstein. <laughs> you know, yes. It's, it's, you got you to gotta play with the right people. Yes. You don't play Planet Steam with Charles. I learned <laughs> that one. Speaking of Charles, next I have chess. Um, I have very fond memories of my parents' marble chess set, one of the more expensive things in our house that was always on display. And at some point, me hitting the age where my dad brought it out into the front room and taught me to play chess. I have no idea what age that was, but I do remember heading to my family Christmas party and destroying some of my uncles. So that's just like a, a formative moment as a kid that, hey, I can beat parents at games that probably is part of what made me sit in this chair talking to you tonight. Um, well, I never played chess hardcore i never looked into standard openings or any stuff like that i still enjoy sitting down to a game of chess so again this is another game where as long as you're kind of on the same level yeah my uh my son loves chess and plays right. plays with some of his friends and plays chess.com but i and it's one of the things i feel guilty about i can't really play chess against him because he is so far <laughs> beyond me yeah. i can't really challenge him I, I i was never a strong chess player uh it was just never something i really did i mean i knew the rules but that was yeah. about it <laughs> uh so that was chess all right next i have the generals this is one a lot of people haven't heard of this was one of my dads and it's basically electronic streak tigo now the awesome part about this game is due to the fact it used a computer you never break the fog of war so when you're playing stratego and your two units face you have to show them both so you both get to see what unit it is before it's destroyed and then there's a whole memory element of the game of what unit was that but it's a fairly simple one 
on this one, when two units meet up, you place them on this special spot on the side of the board. You push them both down and it plays some music and tells you who won. No, this is like 80s music, right? It's not like there's a big fanfare or anything. Well, the goal of the game is to capture the opponent's flag. And then there was also the neat mechanic where the lowest strength unit, which was the bomb, could defeat the toughest strength unit, which was the general, but was diffused by any of the other characters. And then there was a spy and stuff like that. But the whole thing here was that fog of war where you would battle two units. And unless they were the exact same unit and you got a tie, you didn't actually learn what that opponent was, only that they were tough enough to beat yours or you were tough enough to beat them. To me, it was Stratego plus a level. Now, the problem with this one is, well, I would love to play it nowadays. Um, somewhere I have found like someone had done a digital version online and I played it and was like, yeah, the game's still good. I have no way to play this now. I would happily play it. But my dad's copy was one of the ones that had batteries left in it for probably 40 years by the time we discovered it. And it wasn't just the white caked on stuff like it had done some real damage and it was not in a rescuable shape when I found it. And looking online, there are some reasonably priced copies, but not enough to to win out over, you know, spending my money on a brand new shiny game. And that was the unfortunately acidified acid. <laughs> They're the generals. <laughs> the acidified acid. The acidified acid. <laughs> See, the, the, generals. The, the strobing Sauron's yeah. eye goes off. All right, for my last game, my last board game, I'm going to finish off with what I consider my introduction to hobby gaming. To go back to our last episode, see, even a month apart, I got continuity there. Talking about my board game journey, when I moved into hobby games, that would have been Talisman 2nd Edition from Games Workshop. I fell hard into this game, like hard. I eventually managed to seek out and pick up every expansion, which nowadays sounds like you go online and order them all. Back then, that mainly meant going to Toronto in the only Games Workshop specialty store in Michigan to find these games. Because at the time, Games Workshop was still only in the UK, and you had to import everything. I grabbed every White Dwarf magazine with additional rules. For anyone who remembers the advanced careers, that's where that came from. Made it actually feel like Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. And I even tried to collect a full set of miniatures for the game. That is the one thing I did fail on. I never got them all. Now, around the same time, I also got into Dungeon Quest, Fury of Dracula, Blood Bowl, other Games Workshop games. But of all of them, Talisman's the one I keep playing. My copy of Blood Bowl is right there behind me. You can see it on the picture. I don't remember the last time I took that out and actually played it. We talk about it. Sean's in Windsor. Maybe we'll actually do it, but I haven't touched that game in years. Meanwhile, Talisman tends to come out at least once a year. It seems like just as a, a, a great, ver I don't know. It, it's The game has its problems. It's going to take us forever. And yes, you right when you're about to win, someone will do something to set you back. And it's got the munchkin problem of never ending and everything else. And yes, the modern versions are improvements. You get that same talisman feel in a much more reasonable time frame, but just nothing quite matches playing the original second edition with all the stuff. You got to have it all in, all the extra boards, the flipping timescape and all the characters. Use the minis if you have them, you know, you got to have it all there. For me, that is an awesome game night. That is a... a, a fantastic game to sit down invite older friends over that i've known for years and play some talisman and that was talisman second edition with all the bells and whistles yes so the one thing we didn't really get into here are rpgs and i have two i think are worth mentioning so first up is tsr's marvel superheroes this was my first ever rpg experience no i did not start with dnd my first box was a yellow box starter set over the years, I ran many games of this for my friends and family and picked up a ton of different content from the game, including the advanced rules and all the other stuff. Now, what surprises me the most about this game is just how well it still plays to this day. While the tone of comic books has definitely changed since then, and when I run the game, we now play it as a retro game, like you are playing 80s comic book characters. You're not playing the modern versions, you're playing the 80s versions with the 80s style storylines, as cheesy as some of them were, like the clone saga from Spider-Man. Um, and But the mechanics still work great. Like, it's actually a fairly rules-light system, especially if you just play with the basic rules. Now, sure, there's some wonky bits, like spending your XP to modify your die rolls and specific karma rewards, but that whole universal table and area-based movement system still stands the test of time. And well, you know how I what I think about superheroes. So that was <laughs> Marvel Superheroes from TSR. Now, the other RPG that I got into in my teens and will still happily play or run today is Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. 
I got to this through Talisman. Talisman introduced me to Games Workshop, which led me to Warhammer Fantasy Battle, which led me to Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Wolfrup was my system long past my 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 childhood, past my teens, into my tweens, into my 20s, and is still probably the RPG system I know best. That said, the newest fourth edition really does look like it goes back to the roots and may become a new love I'm talking about in 20 years from now. Uh, unlike Mo, uh, I didn't start with Marvel. Mo started pre prior to me with his Marvel addiction, and I actually started with Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Uh, that was where I got my uh, my start to role playing, and uh, still have serious love for that game. Yeah. And I, I agree that I think the fourth edition uh, really could uh, bring it all back to us. And that was Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. All right, well, enough reminiscing about good old games. That's it for our list of games we loved it as kids that we will happily play today. Now, what are some games from your childhood that you still play and enjoy? Tell us about them in the comments. Remember, we're here to answer your gaming game night questions. If you got a question for us, head to tabletopbellhop.com, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hit me up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word.